Hey guys, Sean from Trigger Precision Machine here. Welcome to the channel. The last couple episodes we talked about reloading specific to precision rifle cartridges. We talked about the tools that I use, we talked about the documentation. So today we're going to actually go through the loading process. I have some brand new Peterson 300 Norma Mag Brass here and some 245 Burger EOLs. So I'm going to take you through the whole process and this is the result of me doing this for 20 years. Lots of failures, lots of successes. So this is kind of what I've arrived at as far as the reloading process that works for me. So let's take a look. All right, guys, so here we are. We have our six pieces of brand new, beautiful Peterson brass. So the first thing that I do is I inspect the brass that I'm gonna reload. And it doesn't matter if it's new brass, high quality brass like Lapua or this Peterson, or if it's fired brass, I still go through this procedure every time. So I just check the primer pockets and the flash holes, make sure the flash holes aren't obstructed. Those all look good. And then I'll take the brass and check the body and the neck and just make sure there's no major dents or anything that can't be repaired during the sizing process. And all these look pretty good. Cool. So after that, the next thing I do is I start with the, the bottom side of the case, the head, and I'll start with uniforming the primer pockets. So if you can see, this new Peterson brass has a nice, shiny, clean primer pocket. So I take that one step further and I have this little carbide primer pocket tool chucked up in this Milwaukee cordless drill. And the process is very simple. I spin it on low speed and then we just stick the cutter in there. And what that ends up doing is it squares up the edges of the inside of the primer pocket and gives you a nice flat surface down there where the cup is gonna seal and give you nice positive ignition. So you have a little bit better consistency with your reloads from what I found. All right guys, so we'll go ahead and uniform the primer pockets on the rest of this brass. So it's just a real quick couple seconds and you see some little brass shavings coming out of there. You can actually feel the cutter engaging on the surfaces in there. So I usually do it until I don't feel any resistance on the cutter anymore. Right about there. nice and one more all right so now once that's done we have nice clean and square primer pockets the next step is I will make sure the flash holes are nice and round by running this little hand reamer tool through the flash hole so forget the actual dimension of this. I want to say it's 62 thousandths of an inch. I could be wrong, but the dimension of this little reamer is what the primer flash hole should be. So we insert this like this and it just takes a couple quick turns like that. And it actually got a little chip out of there. So we'll run through the rest of these. Just a couple quick turns. And it's actually cleaning out a little bit of material. So that just tells me that these flash holes are on the smaller side, which isn't necessarily bad, but they can be inconsistent. So everything about this process is being consistent and meticulous with what you do. So it's easy for us to sit there and go through these flash holes and make sure that they're all nice and uniform. All right, guys. Our next step of the process is to get the sizing operation done. So even though this is new brass and you could technically reload it right now because the necks are already undersized, um, I like to run it through my sizing die and just make sure I have the consistency among all the brass that I'm loading. And it's something that, once again, I do every single time. So consistency is key. 
So first thing we're gonna do is I use this Imperial Sizing Dye Wax. This is the best stuff that I've found. It's a little messy and there's a cleanup procedure required afterwards because it's, it's almost like a, uh, feels like almost petroleum jelly or something like that. So I'll take this. We use this very sparingly, so I just get a little on my finger. And we'll just rub it on our, our CBS case lube pad here. And then we take our cases, lay them down in a row like that, and then just roll them. And you can kind of see they got a nice little coat of wax on them now. Cool. So let's size them. couple things to cover before we get into the sizing process. So like I mentioned before, I'm using new brass here. This is new Peterson brass and it's generally undersized from the factory. So on fired brass, what I would do prior to this process is I would use my little Sinclair comparator here and this insert would replace that one. And then you put the, the case in the calipers and basically the angle inside of the comparator insert gives you a reference dimension from the angle of the shoulder all the way to here to the case head. So ideally we want to bump that back two thousandths of an inch or at least one thousandth of an inch. And that gives us some wiggle room and make sure that our ammo will chamber properly. But for new brass, that isn't really a concern. I've never ran into that. Like I said, it's usually pretty undersized. So we're just going to run through the sizing process just to make sure that there's no, uh, abnormalities or deformities and just to maintain some consistency in our, our reloads. So before we get started with that, here we are at the Area 419 press. We have a precision ground plate here in the RAM. I use that for the bullet seating process. We'll put that back in later. But for now, we got to put our shell holder in. So this is a little RCBS shell holder with an adapter and that just goes right in there and put our cap back on. And I believe that's a number 48 RCBS shell holder, just a, a standard one. And then we've got to locate our die on the turret here. So currently I'm set on the 300 Norma Magnum seating die. So on the left side of the press, there's an Allen screw with a little torque wrench. So we'll rotate it around to number six, and that's going to be my bushing full length die. And these are all Redding dies. And it's all set up for where I want it to be from some previous reloading. So we'll torque our bolt back down, make sure the press is ready to go. And then it's as simple as running it in there all the way down to the bottom. And then I usually give it a 180 degree turn and run it one more time. And that's it. We'll run through the other five here. And I can tell this is new brass because there's very little resistance when you're pushing the brass into the die. And these are all coming out looking good. So pretty simple process. And once again, I can't harp on it enough, but consistency is key. So I always do that little 180 degree turn on my brass just to make sure that it gets sized properly. All right, and we have six pieces of sized brass. All right guys, so I went ahead and cleared off the workspace and just got the tools out of the way that we already used. So for a small batch of brass like this, I generally will just wipe it off with a rag and get the wax off of it. If it's a larger batch of brass, let's say more than 20 or so, then I'll throw it in my Dillon vibratory tumbler and the corn cob or the walnut media, whatever I have in there, takes the wax off pretty good. But for a small batch like this, it's fine to just wipe it off. And as I'm doing that, I also do another visual inspection and make sure that there's no defects or anything in our brass from the sizing process. So now we'll get into our trim process. All right, this is probably my favorite part of the whole reloading process, just because I, I love this machine. This is a Giro Tool Company case trimmer, and I mentioned in the, the tools video the other day that 
this thing does a whole bunch of things at once. So it does your trim to length, your chamfer on the inside, and then your deeper on the outside of the case neck or the mouth. And it uses these little nifty shell holders you buy from Giro, and these are caliber specific. And then I just use regular reloading die lock nuts, and that sets them at the right length. So we'll put that guy back in there. Make sure it's tight, and we'll turn it on. He just does such a nice job. And it's as simple as that. That machine is that fast and that easy to use. And it does an absolutely beautiful job on these case mouths. And every single one of them is perfect. Just an awesome tool. When we were over there doing the initial sizing process, I mentioned that there was a, a bolt on the side of the Area 419 press, and that's what locks the turret into place when you select the different positions. So Area 419 gives you this little preset torque wrench. So we just loosen that up, and that lets you rotate. And there's a hard stop. There's a detent here on the head that stops on each position. For this operation, we actually have to remove this head and put the spare head in. So simply loosen that up a little bit and the head comes out. It's got a nice little place back there to hold them. Then we're gonna put my spare head right here and we just push it down. Run the clamp down and then hit the torque wrench until it pops like that, and we're set. All right, so we got our turret head all swapped over. We're ready to go for the next operation. So for this operation, I expand the necks back up basically one thousandth of an inch. So the sizing die we used previously had a bushing that essentially gives me three thousandths of neck tension. That's a little more than I like, and that's on purpose because then I run this mandrel through it, and this mandrel is two thousandths of an inch undersized from 30 caliber, so 308 minus two thousandths gives you 0 0.306, which is two thousandths neck tension. That's ex exactly where I wanna be. Not a lot of people do this, and my reason for doing it is, even though this is great quality brass, we cannot know for sure if every single neck is the same thickness. So if you have a case or a couple cases with thicker or thinner necks, that's gonna change the inside dimension when you size it with the bushing on the outside of the neck. Another way of going around this is a lot of people will expand the necks to a known diameter on the inside, and then they run a trimmer over the outside of the neck, and that gives you a very consistent neck dimension. And from that point on, you can neck size them, and you know that the inside diameter is gonna be the same for the correct tension. So we'll put this little expanding mandrel together. And it's got this little riser with a window there that you can see the, the mandrel. Put that here into position six. And there we go. That's about right. One thing we have to do before we run these cases through this expanding mandrel is we have to lubricate the inside of the neck. So I use the same imperial wax that we use for the sizing operation and just get one of these Q-tip applicator things, and I'll just give it just a little bit on the inside, and that's all you need to do. That's it. All that does is just lubricates the inside of the neck for the expanding mandrel, so you don't get any galling or anything like that, and you get a nice 
smooth finish in there. And that's that. So now we're ready to run them through our expanding mandrel. And here we go. And it's as simple as that. So you run it up the mandrel until the mandrel is fully inserted and it just gives you a perfect inside dimension. And one quick thing to talk about is this only works with well annealed brass or new brass. So brass that hasn't been work hardened in this area. If you have brass that's been fired three or four times, it begins to get work hardened. And what that means is you're gonna have more spring back. So the brass, after we shoot it, each time we shoot it, it gets harder and harder. So we have to anneal the brass at some point. I typically will anneal my brass every single firing. I like to take care of it. And because I do this procedure, I feel like it makes it more consistent. Hopefully this angle shows a little bit better, but if you look right here, move our case up, see it comes up onto the mandrel, and then nice and smooth back out. And this press is so smooth and so solid. And that's that. All right, guys, so we completed all the case prep here on the head end of the case. We completed all the case prep here at the, the neck end of the case, so we're all sized. Our necks have been expanded back out, so we have a good two thousandths of an inch bullet tension. So the only thing left to do before we prime these and charge them with powder is we have to remove that lube we put inside the neck. I like these necks to be nice and clean and the lube's gonna give us an inconsistent grab on the bullet. So the way I do that, take my Dillon Vibratory Tumbler, I'll throw them in there, and I'll run them for 20 minutes to a half an hour, and that does a pretty good job of removing all the lube from the inside of that case neck. We'll snug this down, and we'll come back in 20 minutes and check on them. So 20 minutes have gone by. Take these guys out. Set that over here. And then I use this little Franklin Arsenal media separator. Thing works pretty good. I've had it for several years. And it's just simple and it works. We'll dump all this into here. Pour the, looks like I'm using corn cob. Pour the corn cob back into the tumbler. That's usually all it takes, just a few turns. And our brass is nice and clean and ready to go. Got a little dust on it, but dust wipes right off. So we'll go ahead and do that next and we'll get them ready to prime and charge. All right guys, so our cases are all nice and wiped off and clean. So now it's time to prime them. I've got my RCBS hand prime tool here. This is set up already with some, can't see the label because it's ripped off, but Federal Gold Medal Match, Large Rifle Magnum Primers. So we're just gonna go ahead and prime these guys up real quick. Make sure they're seating nice and flush. Looks good. And the last one. 
and it's all seated real nice. And when you're using this thing, if you use it enough, you can actually feel the, the resistance of the primer going into the primer pocket. And after these things get fired a half a dozen times or more, maybe less, just start to feel the primer pockets get loose. If I have one that is noticeably looser than the rest, then I'll toss that case aside and either check it out or just throw it away because what that does is when you have the loose primers, the gas from the combustion that happens inside of the case can go backwards and leak out. And it's almost like a, it almost has a cutting effect on the head of your bolt. So I've actually had uh, hot rounds with loose primers and stuff. And when the, the hot gas and stuff goes back out of the loose primer pocket, it can actually mess up your, the bolt to your rifle. So we want a nice good seal and make sure they're nice and tight. All right, moving on to charging these things up with some powder. I'm gonna be using the Hodgdon Rotumbo. I try to stick with these Hodgdon Extreme powders. I found that they're very, very temp stable. And up here we can have close to 100 degree spread in temperature, depending on the season and the time of the year. So we'll go ahead and pour some of this to our auto trickler hopper here. Put some into our trickler. And that should be enough. All right, make sure that our cup is empty and our zero is good on the scale. So it actually had a couple kernels of powder in it. So we'll re-zero it and we're off. All right guys, so I got our charge weight programmed in this is the Auto Trickler V3. So it consists of this auto throw right here and then the trickler right here. And the programming is actually done on an app on your phone. So it's super intuitive, easy to use. It's all programmed in for 85 grains. So as soon as we set our cup back in there and it hits zero, then it'll start dispensing. And it's pretty fast. So it overshot, oh, there it corrected. So it's just over two tenths of a grain, which two tenths of a grain is of this Rotumbo powder. That's basically one little stick of powder. So I'm good with that. And it keeps fluctuating back and forth between 85 and 8502. So use these nice area 419 funnels. They have interchangeable tips here for different calibers. I obviously have the 30 cal one in now. So that just goes right on there and we'll charge it up. All right, so now we're all charged up and ready to go. Like I mentioned, we're gonna be loading these 245 Burger EOL Elite Hunters, 807 G1BC, pretty impressive, one or nine minimum twist. So take these guys out and when I was off camera, I swapped the heads back out on the Area 4190 press. So we have our other head back on. I have the little precision ground plate and we're on the Reading Competition seating die for the 300 Norma right now. So we'll just take our cartridge or our case, set our bullet in there like that, fairly square. And then it just rests right on this precision ground plate. And I run it up halfway like that, nice and slow to get the case aligned with the die, and then it's just a smooth motion in. And there is a loaded round. So now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna check our dimension here. I mentioned uh, yesterday when we were talking about the data sheet and the reloading documentation that I use the dimension from the ogive, which is basically where the radius of the bullet or the, I'm sorry, the the curvature of the bullet reaches full diameter. So where this curve goes up and it actually ends up at 0 0.308, from that point to the case head is the dimension that we load to. I generally don't use overall length from the tip of the bullet to the end of the case. And that's just because the tips of the bullets can have some inconsistencies in them. And I can see it with the naked eye. There's quite a bit of deviation in these. Some people will uniform the tips of these bullets. A lot of bench rest guys do that. 
I don't, so I just use this dimension from the ogive to the case head. All right, guys, before we load the rest, I'll show you how I take that dimension from the ogive to the case head. So I use these calipers with the Sinclair International Comparator and it has a 30 caliber insert in it right now. So what I'll do is run the calipers flush up against it, make sure they're zeroed. And then I want my loaded round to be 2.688. So we slowly move our way back up. And that's close enough, all right. So once we're there, then I'll zero it out at that dimension. And then we take our loaded round, just gently insert it into there. You don't need to cram it in. And then we'll run it up against the head. And we're about eight and a half thousandths of an inch long. So super easy to do it that way because basically the reading that you'll get is whatever you need to change your die. So with that being said, we need to take eight and a half off of our length. So we'll run our micrometer die down eight thousandths of an inch. And that should be it. And then I'll take a new case, seat the bullet. And usually it's spot on the second time around. So make sure that we're at our 2.688, put our bullet back in and it's dead on. So that's the nice thing about these reading micrometer dies is you have direct readings up here on the micrometer and you can make adjustments like that very easily. All right, so we'll go ahead and charge up the rest. And that's it. So we have our six beautiful loaded rounds. Just absolutely gorgeous looking. So before we wrap it up today, I'll go over something that I talked about in the documentation video. And that is marking your cases or keeping track of how many times they're fired. So on brass like this 300 Norma Magnum brass, this stuff is not cheap. I like to make it last as long as possible and try to take care of it. I anneal this stuff every time, so generally speaking, I don't mark my case heads. However, hypothetically, if this was something else, like let's say 6.5 Creedmoor, that I'll usually anneal those every four to five reloadings, I would go just take a Sharpie as simple as that, and I hope you guys can see that. Just two small lines on the case head, and that would tell me that this case has been fired twice. So when I go run this through the rifle again, and next time I load it, I'll put a third mark on there. And when I get to four, if this was 6.5 Creedmoor, then after I tumbled it and cleaned it up, I would anneal it and get it ready to reload. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed that and got something out of it. I know there's a lot of information about reloading out there. I might do things a little different. I might do things the same as everyone else, but I hope you got something out of it. And in a following video, I wanna take you guys through the process of prepping the fired brass. So that consists of the, using the wet tumbler. And from then on, the procedure is mostly the same, but we can go over that too as well in a future video. So thanks for sticking around guys. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a good weekend.